of the Muslim communities in North America brought back to life a beautiful aspect of Islam that has been greatly missing and that's when the brothers and sisters in the Tampa Bay community in Florida made a very powerful remark and gesture in the light of what is happening in the US with the detention of the children of so-called illegal immigrants taking the children away from them and putting these illegal Im immigrants in detention putting their kids in some sort of detention camps or centers so the Muslim community in Tampa ventures and reaches out to the US administration offering them a solution basically saying this is unacceptable and they offered to take care of 2300 children that are in these detention centers completely funded by the Muslim community in Tampa it's a concentrated effort by some sort of good leadership in that community where they called upon the members of the community and they ventured forth and they secured pledges from business business people well-off rich Muslims who were able to pledge to pay the cost of transporting all 2300 kids to the community and then they got an agreement or pledges from Muslim families in the communities in the community to host these children in a great manifestation of what Islam really means one beautiful part of Islam and Islam is far bigger than that but unfortunately we need more of this because Islam that's what Islam calls us to it's, it's supposed to be a daily thing of what Islam really means in our lives it's supposed to be a common occurrence among Muslims not only in that community but in every Muslim community and Muslim society throughout the globe and this reminds me of something that happened about 170 years ago when Ireland was in a state of famine and people in Ireland were dying in the hundreds of thousands out of starvation in the about 1845 and this is actually this sparked the wave of Irish immigration into North America to the United States and to Canada it was the famine people were especially poor people were unable to eat people were dying literally dying of starvation and the world tried to support but they could not deal with the famine the Muslim Caliph at the time Abdul Majid al Awwal the Ottoman Caliph he reaches out to Ireland and he offers 10,000 sterling which now estimates in the hundreds of millions and probably probably billions as a gift as a gift and support from the Muslim Caliphate from the Muslim world at the time to Catholic Ireland at the time because of the famine and the starvation and who stands in the face of this the British Queen Victoria because she herself donated 2,000 sterling to Ireland and refused that anyone offers more than she did thus Abdul Majid al Awwal the Muslim Caliph at the time could only give to the people of Ireland 1,000 sterling what did he do with the remaining 9,000 he bought provisions he brought he bought uh, wheat he bought corn different types of food to be consumed and then he set a whole fleet of Ottoman ships in order to sail to Ireland in order to drop all of this food and all of this provision to Ireland to the people who need it and they were stopped by the British fleet and there was they were prevented from delivering that so they ended up to some sort of a small port in Ireland and they delivered all of that to the Irish people that's what the Muslim world did about a hundred and seventy years ago and it's not for the purpose of show 
It's not for the purpose of publicity and propaganda. This is what Islam really is. This is part and parcel, and parcel of what Islam is. And where does the problem lie? Why, 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 does, why don't we see today more examples of this? It doesn't have to be the Ottoman Empire. It doesn't have to be the Caliph. It doesn't have to be a community. It could be an individual. It could be you and I, every one of us. And why look too far? Don't search for nations who are in starvation. Look for people at home, people who need it. Our children, our spouses, our neighbors. People who are sitting right next to you in the masjid. People who work with you in the workplace, sitting right with you in the same office. How come we have turned a blind eye as Muslims to these beautiful meanings in our religion? How come? That's when we take Islam in a technical way. You know the great companion, <clears throat> Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu, he said, Thalathun, man jama'ahunna faqad jama'a al-eemana kullahu. Three things. Anyone who possesses all of them, then he possesses all of Iman. All of Iman. Al-insafu min al-nafs. That you give people rights against yourself. You stand for justice even if it's against yourself. وَبَذْلُ salam And offering people greetings and also peace. As Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim explains this in Zad Al-Ma'ad. And he says, this means that you offer people peace. That you have to be humble to offer people, start people with greetings. And to give people their rights and to treat them well. And the third thing, وَالْإِعْطَاءُ مِنْ قِلَّةِ And basically to give when you have very little. These three things constitute all of Iman according to this great companion Ammar ibn Yasir. The Prophet وسلم, one day turns to the believers and he says, He turns to the believers, which of faith is the most great? Which of it? So the companions say, the one who's with the most prayers, the one with the most fast, the one, the one, all of these are great acts of acts of worship. These are the pillars of Islam. Yet the Prophet ﷺ says, The best among the believers in their faith is the one who people feel safe for their souls and for their property with regards to him. He's no threat to people. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, this is the greatest of faith. So how come, how come we reduce Islam to certain elements and then we turn these elements into a cult where we push people away from Islam, even Muslims who were born Muslims. How come we do that? How come we, we play around with the religion and the deen and the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way where we do dehumanize it? There are people who have emotional problems, mental issues, and then they find some way to express this in some aspects of Islam to the exclusion of the rest. And then they want to build an image of Islam based on this. And they hijack the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have the guts to say that's Islam. They have the guts to persecute others. They have the guts to ostracize others and to call them out. What? based on a selective choice, cherry-picking way of implementing Islam. And no nation has ever done this to Islam except that they have lost. They were lost in history and their power was taken away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and many times we brought this issue and we'll keep bringing it up. Because the fact that we're not practicing Islam properly the fact that we are eliminating important aspects of islam and compartmentalizing islam and dividing islam and being very selective and choosing in our approach to islam is ki killing our hearts is killing our hearts you know a fake image of islam if you just fool yourself and make yourself happy because you do certain things when you're violating important things about islam doesn't do any justice to your heart it doesn't do good to your heart the fake thing doesn't work. It just doesn't work. 
And that's why we have an issue of morality among ourselves. We have an issue of respect. We have an issue with our hearts, with our spirituality, with our morality. That's why Muslims are not seeing great opportunities to really practice their Islam. I don't want you to see these things that the Ottoman Caliph did at the time. Or these Muslims in Tampa Bay are doing today, mashallah. I don't want you to see this as an act of propaganda, as something to show. You don't have to show. This is an opportunity to practice Islam first. And when we practice Islam, people get to see about it. People get to see the truth. But when we are on the sidelines, when we marginalize ourselves and stop being relevant to life, we trying to live on the margins and insist that's what Islam is. We forget that the Muslims from, re, from the early stages, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions were never on the sidelines. They were never marginalized. They always played a role in their society. They always, they were relevant to their times. And that's why the scholars of Islam say, Al-Islam is relevant to every time and every place. And some scholars say, بَلِ الْإِسْلَامُ صَالِحٌ وَمُصْلِحٌ لِكُلِّ زَمَانٍ وَمَكَانٍ Islam is not only relevant to every time and space, but Islam is also has rectifying capacity. It sets everything right in every time and every place. And if Islam is not playing this role, there's a problem with the understanding that we have about Islam.